Bungalow Bill here. I think it's time to start building a new airship. We're going to start with the main guns, which will be armor-piercing high explosive, so I hope everyone's ready for some penetration. The airship will use helium pumps like the previous ones I've built recently. It isn't as strong a choice as a thruster craft, but I've been having fun with them recently. I'm intending it to replace the Anubis, so it is aimed at the late to mid game for cost. I'm intending to make it as part of a sister ship with a submarine named the Tycho and Tycho Under. If you get the reference, it probably makes one of you. I'm going to try to outfit the airship version in a way that won't need much conversion work to become a submarine. That mostly means that I won't be using lambs, so I'll be using shields for defense against APS and packs for defense against ICBMs and small planes. I never built the helium based craft on the scale, so you'll see how I piece together a new type of craft that I don't necessarily know how to build. I do loosely intend to build this one with lots of empty space and compartments throughout to distribute the lift, but we'll see how it works. Anyway, let's get on to blowing things up. Here we are on my weapons test platform. I've not really used armor piercing high explosive before, since it had gotten so heavily nerfed that it was almost completely useless. So I'll walk you through the process of how I build subsystems when I have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm going to quickly slap down a turret so that this thing can aim, but I'm not really going to be doing very much beside that. What I'm building right now is not something that I would properly call a gun. It's simply something for me to test a few different numbers. Now, I do have some idea of the point in the game that this vehicle is going to be coming out at and roughly what it'll be competing with at that point. So I'm going to pick six meter autoloaders for a balance between rate of fire and just how expensive the gun will wind up being to achieve that rate of fire. Since it is going to be armor piercing high explosive, we are going to need to ejector it. You can sometimes get away with not ejectoring railguns, but that's not really necessarily, necessarily a valid choice at this point. If you want to know how to do APS Tetris in general, there's a, there's a borderwise video for that. And this one is not so much going to be about that. What we're, what we're just doing with this railgun here, or with the sample here, is throwing together something really quickly so that we can look at some numbers and do some testing. The actual customizer modules will show us a lot of, a lot of the numbers that we need, but There are there are other other considerations like rail charge, the relative numbers of railgun chargers that we're going to need, that sort of stuff. Also, I um, don't like this being so purple, so I'm just going to throw in two wood blocks there to make everything attached to everything else. I am, however, going to going to get rid of that at some point. I'll attach these here, but I don't I don't really plan on actually. I'm actually using this exact shell, it's for another gun that I was designing on this platform in the past. So, mantlets. Now, as soon as we put down a mantlet, we're deciding which mantlet to use, there's the obvious question of what we're using the gun for. So I intend to put this on an airship, and I do want it to be an airship that primarily is designed for killing ships. It has some potential to kill submarines. So I was thinking about putting the turrets on the bottom of the airship, kind of like the Anubis. But this will be helium pump floated, so unlike the Anubis, which can go to a relatively high altitude, this will not be capable of doing that. It'll cap out at around 270 meters at the absolute highest. So I'm thinking that I'm still going to put an elevation mantlet, and I'm going to try to design the deck geometry so that it'll be able to fire up at a moderate angle despite the guns being under it. We will see if that actually works or not. If it doesn't, I might switch to an AA mantlet instead, which will give slightly better elevation for shooting down. But we'll see. There's there's really no way to know. Slap on a nice big chunking barrel, and then just an absolutely excessive number of parts. So 
since it's going to be ammo ejectored, I'm going to set the gauge manually a little bit lower than 500 millimeters probably, but right now I'm just making sure that this thing has enough parts. So the next step is going to be choosing an approximate shell for it. And then once we've done that, I'm going to tweak the gun a little bit more, figure out the ratios that we're going to start looking at between railgun components and the normal APS components, as well as what stats those are going to start to cause. So we'll crank this all the way up and see what our shell length is. So that's a 10 meter shell plus casing, which is obviously, obviously quite excessive. Now that we do that, 7.2. Oh, it's because we have a base bleeder on here. We're going to have both, both a base bleeder and an ammo ejector. So quickly edit the shell, put in a nose. The, the shell is going to be pretty random at the moment because I don't really... I don't really exactly have the strictest thing in mind for how I want this to be. I just want to see what the length is going to look like because of the fuses and the fact that I don't want to do the math. So it looks like we can add on two more modules and then reduce the shell gauge a little bit. And that'll get us the fullest use of, that'll get us the fullest use of the, of the actual clip size. So let's put an armor piercing head back on, put two of our solid bodies on, wind up with something like this, and we'll find out what the gauge needs to be. All right, looks like 483, which is a number that I think I have seen quite often, so I probably could have just, just remembered that. We will now set our gauge to 483 so that this gun will be able to load. We will put on an excessive number of these if I um, put them on the right orientation, or at least an excessive number of these for what I'm intending to do. It's not telling me how much rail charge I have because I don't have any any way of generating rail charge. Now, I actually really care about how many railgun components I'm using as a ratio of this vertical space that I have. So I'm going to build sort of this platform so that I can put in rail components in a way that mimics the sort of eight meter auto loader plus ammo intake plus ammo ejector stack. And I'm just going to put in some number of them. We'll see how accurate slash inaccurate this is later, but I'm going to put in two stacks to make this block. We're going to stop the, stop the rail guns from spinning because that's kind of annoying. Oops, that wasn't what I wanted. We will change this to the number that we come up with later. Just curious at us having, just looking at basic numbers like auto loader limit 1.5 RPM, and then the capacity 6,400 per second. So that would give us as, as well as the rail use that we're looking at there, which is considerably under the under the capacity currently. This is very 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 heavily biased towards towards rail charge at the moment. All right, so now what we're gonna do is just sort of just sort of flux. So the maximum rail draw is one hundred and ten thousand. 
Yep, so it's 100,000. And then we'll just look to see what to see what sort of stats we'd work with with that. I haven't put in put in anything else. I suppose I'm also going to need a penetration depth fuse, so I should have should have put that in as well, which is um starting to consume starting to consume a lot of our spots with just stuff, but that will affect our our length as well. This does not just turning up the gauge all the way doesn't quite doesn't quite get us back. So we might wind up with one more module and a slightly decreased a slightly decreased gauge again, which is not quite what I want. Since I'm going to be using high explosive, I really want to be as close to 500 millimeters as I can, which is when they're most most effective. But what I'm really trying to optimize for here is did this not get oh shell plus casing six point three okay so what I'm what I'm really trying to optimize here is using the entire the entire clip length I haven't run this through an APS calculator or anything to see if that's actually the most optimal or if that'll actually wind up being the most optimal but it probably will be. And we'll just see what the rough estimates are. So 55.5 expected armor pierce. That's I believe that's enough to to fully pen metal and have have enough for penetration because 40 armor, but not enough for heavy armor, which is 60. And I'm fine coming in at, at a little bit under heavy armor. Of course, this is gonna look worse and worse as we start to strip out solid bodies and replace them with high explosive. So let's see how these numbers start to change. 54. That's not so bad, actually. We're losing a little bit of mu muzzle velocity as well. These don't have the speed modifier that solid bodies have. And we're losing a little bit of armor pierce, but not very much. And we're gaining some ex high explosive damage as a trade-off. Now, I sort of want to consider, also look at, well, maybe I can... Maybe I can reduce the gun or increase gunpowder, reduce, reduce module size. That that is a trade-off that I that I have to look at a little bit, and I can take a few data points for that. I'm not sure exactly how heavily I want to optimize it. For now, I just really want to see. So we've put in three three bodies. We've lost about ten percent of our armor pierce. And we haven't lost that much kinetic damage. So so far this is looking looking way more viable. So th there's also extremes to go on. Like, how bad does this get? What if I just put an armor piercing head on top of a high explosive warhead? All right, now we're at forty two armor pierce with fifty five thousand kinetic damage, and we're doing sixteen thousand explosive damage. Now let's look again at what this was with all solid bodies. All right, back to all solid bodies. So that's 60,000. So we're only losing 5,000 kinetic damage. We are going all the way down to the armor piercing of metal which means that we're losing a third of our kinetic, kinetic damage against heavy armor. It's actually pretty interesting, though. And it looks like these have the same rail draw stats as solid bodies, so I don't need to adjust, adjust the rail for them. And just quickly, I'm not sure that... that this will change the stats at all, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clear the clips anyway. Okay, so right now I'm just going to match the rail use and the capacity and see what I'm roughly looking at here. All right, so in terms of volume of autoloaders to rail components, it's about five to two. Let's look at the recoil now. Yep, 
because we are launching very fast shells and they're pretty big. This is this is going in very heavy on the rail draw side. I'm not really doing any experiments here in terms of shifting between rail draw and gunpowder. I'm just sort of placing a point and using it. You certainly you certainly can, and it's probably a very interesting experiment, but I'm not doing it. Okay, and this matches the absorption pretty well because I can sneak in a little bit here. So in terms of space, I basically need about as much non-rail space as I need rail space. That's going to turn out to be to be slightly inaccurate. Right now we're using a little bit less non-rail space and we're going to have a little bit of extra extra room up top that I'm not using. But that's about what we've got. So I'm just going to slap down some rail tetris or I'm just going to slap down some tetris pretty quickly and just use this the way that it is. There might be some some arguments to be said to go higher or lower on on rail draw because to get to a hundred thousand, oh, okay, I had that slightly off. Yeah, I was gonna say to get to a hundred thousand, we need very, very long railgun magnets to the point where they might be a little bit long for the for the ship that I'm looking at making. I'm just sort of interested to see how expensive this this gun is. I might look I might look at the stats for a shell that uses sixty thousand rail draw instead. I'm not really going to compare the costs and the firepower per cost and that sort of thing. I'm going to start saving my sub objects, which I have a lot of that are poorly named, by by the name of the vehicle that I'm building them for. So we're looking at eighteen thousand materials for that. That's not so bad. It's going to be a pretty bulky turret cap, though, because if I cut this down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six. If I cut this down here instead, I'll have a significantly smaller area that needs needs high protection in the turret cap. That that said, when I do build this, the back of the turret cap will be back here somewhere. I haven't even I haven't even thrown down the ring yet. I'm actually going to get my turret to the approximate cost that I want. And then I'm going to try to squeeze it into a ring. We'll see how all that works. I might actually put a descending ring of different turret sizes under this and see how that looks, but I probably won't. The only thing is changing the shell size when you have this many fuses and just junk on the back of it is kind of annoying to the point where I don't really want to do it. The other thing is I want to test this both with high explosive warhead bodies and with frags. First, let's just set the rail draw to 60,000. Okay, so this armor piercing is not good enough anymore. It, it just plain isn't. Let's see, our kinetic damage, so about 43,000. So that'll be what, like 22, 23, just off the top of my head, um, metal beams, if it was doing full damage to them. So that that is still sufficient penetration. However, I think I would want to lose, I'd want to bump up the number of gunpowder casings a little bit and lose some of the some of the other stuff. Make the it's making the rail assist a little bit smaller. I think in general, it's a sort of make for a less a less interesting craft than one that has maximum boom. So just for fun, I'm just going to leave it the way it is and have a very high rail draw. So let's see, what's left for me to do at this point? Well, actually, before I Tetris things out, I am just going to shoot something because of course I am. Depth fuse distance, five meters. I really think the worst thing that you can do is underpen an enemy craft and blow up your shell too early. So I'd rather err on the side of, of overpenning them. All right, movement off. Let's just shoot it and see what happens. Rails charging. Oh dear, do, do, do I have a problem?
I might change this to allow it to fire when partially charged. So that if it loses rail rail components, it can still fire to some extent. 8.4 kinetic damage, 15,000 explosive damage. I think we did the 12 meters of penetration and then it stopped. So just as a just as a test, let's set that to 30. So we'll know it's about ready to shoot the next round when the railgun is charged all the way up. That hit way too high. Do we have an do we have an accuracy problem? Yeah, we do. So the problem, and this is something that might we might run into when building the gun as well, is that despite that a recoil, the fact that a recoil absorption well actually it doesn't quite it doesn't quite match. We seem to have gained a little bit of a little bit of recoil. Our absorption isn't even close. This is something that you start to run into if you make relatively small guns with big autoloaders, is that you need way more absorption to stop each individual shell from being inaccurate as you need for the actual gun to fire at its rate of fire. So my problem was with maximum absorption, not absorption over time. I'm still not up to the 106,000 that it needs to just sort of operate as a gun. Almost there. All right, we are there. I kind of want a fresh bulwark, but we'll shoot, shoot this one in a recognizable place now. So I feel like I'm getting cheated somehow. We are not coming we're not coming anywhere to these numbers. Maybe it's defaulting to the first surface time instead. We'll set that to 30 seconds. I think the first surface time is the more accurate way of getting depth right now, although I'm not 100 percent certain. So those are both cranked all the way up. Nope. 8.5 thousand kinetic damage. So we made it about to the inside of this cramped of this cram gun, and then it stopped. Just as a test, I'm gonna switch some of these back to solid bodies and then reload our APS shells and see if maybe the stats are just lying to me. Nine point nine K. So no, I don't think they are. Let's see what happens if I do this without a, without a depth fuse. For now, I'll just change it to something else. I think maybe you can have two emergency ejection fuses. They should, it, it might be the, the closest thing I can come up with as far as stats are concerned. I suppose we have these other fuses too. I don't really want to use them. We're just gonna slap in another, another fuse. So we're either just losing all of this damage from angle of incidence or that was really annoying or there's something funky happening. So this might just be getting lost from angle of incidence. No, we are losing it all from the fuse. So the fuse was detonating us early, despite the fact that I had the stuff set all the way up. Although just just to retest this, let's make these all high explosive warhead bodies again and redo this with no penetration depth fuse, just to make sure that this is going exactly the way that I think it should be. I'm starting to run out of clean places to hit this, although I don't really care. I don't really care that much. Okay, yes, yeah, so this is about what I'm expecting. So we are having issues with our penetration depth fuse. 
30 meters, 30 seconds after first surfacing. I keep trying to click APS and it is getting... Oh, it's because if you click the tiniest bit under APS, you get this big box that's not where the text is. All right. That explains that. That was reasonable, but still a little bit low. I wish there was just like a make guns work again button. That would be really nice. I would get a much better fire rate if I, you know, actually built this gun. We'll give this maybe, maybe one more shot. And then I'll look into actually building the gun. This is just gonna be a question of whether or not I use a fuse at all. I might just have it only explode when it runs out of kinetic energy. I'd rather overpen than underpen anyway. Okay, so this is actually seems to be working okay this time. Maybe I had just gotten stuck with the first surface depth before. It, any case, I might actually just I might actually just not use a penetration depth fuse anyway. I might just go back to making this one one module shorter. Yeah, yeah, actually I'm gonna do that. I'm probably gonna tweak the rail draw ever so slightly later, just to make all the numbers match up correctly. But for now, no penetration depth fuse. Okay, I'm gonna just rough out rough out the turret a little bit and then come back to the recording. Okay, so I did some really quick copying and pasting. I also put a few a few sub objects under this so that I'll be able to find the one that I'm looking for for size under afterwards. I just copied and pasted a bunch of stuff. Most of the rest of the components I'm going to need to put in aren't going to be that expensive. This is the bulk of the cost. And this hit 85,000. So I was just doing that as a way to figure out approximately how many how many of these I'm looking for, because 85,000 per gun is a pretty reasonable amount for the for the vehicle that I'm going for. The math that I usually do is that I spend about I spend about 50% of my cost on on armaments for a vehicle. This one is going to need extra armor because it's going to be or extra armor cost because it's going to be fairly large compared to its armament size because it's required to use helium for flotation. So this one might be closer to 35% or 40% weapon cost. And I want to leave some cost over for secondaries. So I'm figuring I'm going to use about three guns that come in at about 85,000 each. Now I'm going to go ahead and strip off this extra stuff on the side so that I can Tetris these. And then I'm going to put this extra stuff back in to make it turret shaped. All right, so I'm out of testing later and we have a thing. What I did was I wound up seeing that I was wasting a lot of extra on recoil absorption to bring myself up to the maximum cap that I didn't actually need to meet the per second per second recoil. So I went ahead, stepped the rail draw back to 70,000 and added in one more autoloader group in each. I also picked one of the turret ring sizes to fit it in. The wood is the size of the turret well. And I gave myself a little bit of a little bit of metal surrounding it to to guide me as far as the amount of space because I'm going to externally armor externally armor the turret and this is the external turret armor. I did realize that this was supposed to be a space a space with with armor, so um, I'm going to fix that because I have a just small amount of dead space in here and a few extra cooling vents. I'll replace, I'll replace this with armor, move these somewhere else, which will really take the rest of my dead space away. And then I'm gonna armor up the turret and do a few tests. All right, I'm ready for the test. The non-decorative portions of the armor are done. The turret caps I'll figure out when I have the ship because the looks need to be consistent. I think that I want three guns on the ship, so I've put three guns here. The firepower stats are nothing remarkable that in total I have 346 APS firepower. Armor piercing high explosive has always been a little bit like that. These are currently armor piercing frag, but I might test both. I sort of like the idea of armor piercing frag because you can set the frag angle to 180 and it'll do a lot more damage than the 60 degree frag angle. Let's bind in a bulwark and see about how these guns do. 
All right, so that's some nice initial damage. I'm not sure if we got... Hopefully we're not getting many overpens. That's sort of the idea here. Although I don't have penetration depth fuses, so we're going to get some overpens. That's just... That's just what's going to happen. I might mess around with them more later. But really, I don't think I want these detonating unless they've used up all of their kinetic damage. So I'm just sort of fine with it the way it is now. There's also the possibility of using thump or something. Just like it'll be like the old the old hollow point HE or hollow point frag. Where you strip away some armor and then do frag damage to it. For now, I'm pretty satisfied with this. This is looking this is looking pretty good. Let's do one more volley. I'm going to have to double check that the turrets are fully symmetric because it's looking it's looking like they're firing not at the same time. And I don't know if that's an inaccuracy problem or a symmetry problem. I know that they all have the same number of clips, autoloaders. Oh, um, there is actually a problem with it. I don't have... I don't have a fire limit set. I have a few too many cooling vents just to connect everything together. And those differ between between the two guns. There's a, there are a few other things that are just just a tiny bit different. But because the interior of the gun is not actually symmetrical, if you're fitting the turret inside the firing ring rather than sort of sort of the way that I did it, and you get, or the way that I did it being, being a cost-based approach, you can get better symmetries. So mirror symmetry is pretty hard to do with APS because, well, they're not, the Tetris doesn't work well for that. Depending on the geometries that you use, sometimes you can get away with rotational symmetries in your turrets. With 180 degrees for two barrels and 90 degrees for four. All right, they're still not going to fire at the same time because I fixed this a little bit late. But I did at least fix it. It's already looking better. I don't like that I can't tell the damage that's dealt from the rails apart from the frag, but that's okay. With high explosive, I'll be able to tell. I might not have aim point selection on this vehicle, which I do. Target random blocks. That won't do anything at the moment, though, because I have automatic detection on. Oh, well. We'll just we'll just live with it. We'll live with the fact that our detection isn't great, or that our targeting isn't great. So sometimes we'll just shoot off the periphery. But I'm mostly focusing on what's happening when we're hitting hitting the main chunk of the vehicle. So these guns are predominantly going to target the center of vehicles. So far, I'm pretty happy with this compared to compared to pure rails. And I think that's a fair comparison because I have the pen depth fuse off completely, so that's really what we're comparing to. We're not losing a huge amount of rail damage. It'll be more noticeable against heavy armor. But against something like something like the bulwark, it's working okay. We've removed a lot of the above water. Targets are starting to have some trouble now. I'm going to spawn in something else. Let all of our guns recharge. And then look to see what just the first volley does. So that I get a good idea of what the guns are actually doing. Bring in the Kingstead. Turn off its guns and movement so it doesn't distract me. And just do one volley. I didn't really get to look at where shells went, but this looks pretty convincing. I'll check out, we'll look at the black confetti as well. I'll check out a few more so I can see the actual shell trajectories. That was really, really good looking. Looks like we snipped the turret off. Most of our shells went 
at a slightly lower line. I see some fairly juicy components bobbing around. So I'm pretty impressed with this. There is a little bit of optimization to do with these turrets. I didn't test too much the different gunpowder and rail ratios. I really only tried two different ones. And there's a little bit of dead space. I think you could bring the rail charge up to the 75,000 maximum that this ammunition will allow. And I think you can fit all of the components in here if you really try. Might be some optimization that I'll do later, that's always. Oh, we are, um... We are having some issues because I suppose our fortress... No, I don't think that they made that a thing, that god mode will make your fortress not take that damage. It looks like our fortress can't can't supply this much power. I'll slap some more some more stuff on it, do one last test, and then that'll be the end of the video. I for the next video I'm gonna make power plants and secondaries and that sort of thing. And then we'll start to look at how the total cost and the space required and the weight and that sort of things add up and how much space it's going to take me to hold them all, and how much buoyancy I'm going to need to float them. Well, we're, we're raining a few parts, but I don't think they're terribly essential. All right. Do I want to shoot at the Kingstead or something juicier? Let's just finish off the Kingstead. This is still pretty good as it is. I'm pretty happy with with how these are working. Now, I'm not sure how this will get tweaked in the future. It could cause some pretty some pretty severe problems to this vehicle if these ratios get tweaked too much. I might have to completely rebuild these guns. Hopefully it'll be hopefully future balancing will be stuff that I can do some very mild rebuilds. But the damage is looking is looking pretty good per shot compared to just railguns. The penetration isn't the same. I sacrificed maybe like five or six metal blocks or metal four meter beams worth of penetration for this and some damage against heavy armor. Down to 76% on the Kingstead. So the Kingstead is 50%, 50% armor, so that's why it's such a fun test. And the right angles on it are pretty good for testing AP or for testing armor piercing heads because they do full damage. I'm hoping from the angle that I'll have this shoot down from on an airship that it'll do reasonable damage to the deck. And we'll show off the shell that I'm actually I'm actually using here. This is what I went ahead with. It's about half gunpowder a few fuses, and then a fairly small head. It's got a maximum rail draw. Oh, it's got a maximum rail draw of 63,000. I'm kind of an idiot then, because I set these for 70,000, thinking that it was actually doing something. The, the question is, does that really matter too much? I can probably just do that. I don't think I actually need to do this, but I'm going to anyway, just to see if it affects the stats. Yeah, this one can also lose two rail chargers. So yeah, without changing the shell, I can't actually add any rail capacity to it. I'm not sure why I thought, well, I know I thought I was having 70,000. I thought that I was still using a shell that could support the 70,000, but no, we're, we are 100% at, at the rail capacity for the shell now. So we'll set that. Some moderate armor pierce, a little over metal, a fair bit below heavy armor. 36,000 kinetic damage. So for the kinetic damage times AP, this is like half of the first shell that we were looking at, but the firing rate is significantly better. Partially because for the same cost, I'm just able, since I'm using fewer rail components, I'm just able to put in what, 
more auto loaders. But part of it is because gunpowder casings load faster than other things. And then we have 10,000 damage per fragment for 22 fragments. So low fragment count, but a fair amount of damage. Now, frag does have the issue that it's the best against wood. And there's nothing made out of wood that these are going to be particularly necessary against. Because I'm assuming that unless these are bow raking the crossbones, which we did here, we're going to be getting a lot of overpenetration. Yeah, those just go all the way through. And there's really nothing bigger that has a substantial amount of wood in it. Even the crossbones, to some extent, looks like it's made out of wood more than it actually is. Uh, we didn't overpenetrate it all the way there. We probably hit some heavy armor blocks in the middle. So these are these just look like they're fun shells to me. You can tell me in the comments if you've played around with these and have any particular particular impressions or have found anything from testing that I didn't find here because I didn't do I really didn't do a full round of testing to optimize them. I just sort of played around until I found something that looks like it was it's good enough to put in a craft for the campaign, but not necessarily fully optimal. Maybe I can also just put them against something really big to see what type of damage. I'm going to spawn it a little bit closer to see what type of damage they do to do to something that's very large. If I don't crash the game. Of course, we're going to get a fair amount of bounces here. I wonder if we can get in under this layer of shields on the left. Looks like we can. So this looks like pretty good damage. I mean, it's not much different from what we're seeing with the Kingstead because, well, the Kingstead is mostly big enough to prevent overpenetration. I say that, but we're overpenetrating the strongholds. Not that um, there's a lot in the stronghold is one of the main things. But it looks like they really make a mess of things compared to how much rails did in the past because they just spread out so much after their point of impact, again, if they don't go all the way through. So this is what I'm going to go with for my airship. It may need a little bit of tweaking when it goes into the submarine, because the submarine is going to have base bleeders, or not base bleeders, it's going to have super cavitation bases instead of base bleeders. But we'll see when I get there. I'm going to build the airship first, and then I'm going to flip the entire hull upside down and build the submarine. So we'll see how that works. Anyway, that's enough for this episode, I believe. I hope you all enjoyed watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.